Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, this talk, you can take a break from Tensor Networks because I'm not a specialist and I don't, I think, don't even mention it, but we'll have Tensor low rank decompositions and uh, what they think about, what I think about when I think about tensors. Also, I am a applied mathematician with background in probability and I work in mathematical data science. So my first um, part will be to actually explain what sort of compression and then recovery I mean, right? So with this explanation, mathematics of data science, when I think about, uh, well, matrix, not tensor, first one of the interpretations would be not necessarily an operator, but actually matrix with data points. If you have a matrix, you might have your data points, and each data point has a certain amount of um, dimensions. So here it, here it is, your matrix. Um, I'll explain the slide, your matrix, whether your data points are vectors. For example, this is something um, just in here. You would have a data which is um, words, right? And then your words can be encoded as words in English dictionary, so you have zeros or ones, so every word will be a, say, a binary vector. And if you have a sentence, you might have frequencies of words appear in the sentence. The point, my point being is that you have temporal data. Every data point is a vector. Here's your matrix. Here we matrix. So then the question is here, before you look at all this amazing stuff on the slide, if you want to compress this data matrix or this data tensor when you maybe your data points are not represented with one dimension, but maybe there are different actors or there are different ways to represent, so your data is not just one data point is not one dimensional, but maybe has two dimensions, right? So if you think about compression of that, what would come to your mind? So maybe first thing which comes to your mind is actually like low rank decomposition, low rank matrix. You have all these variants of low rank tensors, you have tensor networks, so I can say it here at least, you have different ways to represent the da tensor data in terms of less parameters. And you would be right but this is not what I mean here. <laughs> and I'm planning to motivate it. So you could be interested in just low rank decomposition. There can be various. Here in this motivation slide, I talk about non-negative. I mean, this applications to topic modeling, when you model your words, you can think about zeros and ones of frequencies here. What people found out that just low rank decomposition, some, somewhat similar to the first talk in the first in the morning today, if you do a low-rank matrix decomposition and you also ensure that the entries are not negative, just these products um, take care of cancellations. Basically, you don't have cancellations here and it is you will get interpretable soft clustering here. In particular, if you had, uh, for example, tweets over time or like sentences over time, if you just do uh, decomposition on, by two matrices, which are respectively very tall and very flat, and you also ensure that the element is not negative, you can see interpretation of what were the topics of the data. So you can see the topic modeling from here. Yeah. What's, I, I don't quite understand the reason for the non-negativity. Yeah, so the, there is a, you can compare, you can do it in SVD, or PCA, and you'll have cancellations then. So the negative decomposition shown to have more interpretability. For example, there is a very famous paper, not with text, but with images. I think it was in Nature some time ago, like it's an old paper. People took faces and people did that. When people do PCA, the main component will have the main features of the face in general. So it will be like kind of a low, um, a low resolution version of your face. And then the next components will be like you subtract some spots. When you do non-negative decomposition, you will have eyes by its own, nose by its own, mouth by its own, because you only add, so the different pieces go better together. So it's interpretability thing. And here, what do we do from it later on? We take an um, entry here and we see, okay, this is the intensity of a particular topic, right? So what we have here, we have each row is a topic and we see which topic, um, when, what time it was prominent. And here, which words can be in which topic. So, so non-negative means every entry is non-negative. It's entry-wise non-negative here, yes. And you can think about it when in the matrix world, it's actually much more complicated than just do SVD. You don't have the SVD algorithm here. You start dealing with optimization stuff. But in the tensor world, you can do the same. And this is kind of the level of complexity of CP because CP decomposition is that hard. You could be what looking for- What does CP for, stand for? Huh? What does CP right, stand for? CP, okay. So here, CP stands for Kandekom Parafak or just CP, okay. CP. 
Okay. Just, I'm, I keep thinking ten... completely positive when I read it. No, 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 it's not completely positive. This is a low rank tensor decomposition. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, CP can stand for Candecomb Parafac, or there's other ways to, to do it. But the point is that's exactly what's written here. It's one of the low ranks for tensors. You might have a 3D tensor here. It doesn't have to be non-negative in, gen in general. It's when you represent your tensor, uh, you approximate it as a sum of rank one things, where rank one thing is the outer product of three vectors. So you have, if you have two vectors and you write an outer product, you will have a matrix, right, with the UI VJ coordinates right here. And now you want to create a tensor out of it, so you have W1. So in the i to j -th -k -th coordinate, you will have a product. Then uh, finding CP approximation for tensors and the hard, this is a hard problem. This is what many people, like the, the question is when you can find uh, CP rank in just in particular cases. So this is an approximation thing. I use it here as an example, and I also do the negativity as an example. It won't matter that much for my future talk. I really want to motivate the following. So uh, if we know this low rank CP approximation, we definitely parameterized our data set with m much fewer components, right? Much fewer. If you have no negativity, you have additional interpretation side. I have a slide about it, why it's nice. Um, yeah, how it actually works. Uh, this is one way to have low, uh, low parameterization of your data. So this is just an explanation why you might want to do it in a tensorial way rather than a matrix way, and also how it works. So it works in the following way. So what I explained here, right? We had a news feed, and uh, we have matrices U and V, which are low rank, and they both together can inform what were the topics. How do they do that? If you look at the matrix U, they have topics and which words contribute in which topic, right? So if we make it rank 20, for example, we have like three leading words per topic. And then for each topic from matrix V, we see when it was um, acting. So this is the bad case. This is here, we don't see anything good. When we do it in the tensorial way, we can do the, full, the same thing, and we can see the topics, for example, the um, leading words for some topic was something about water plan, something about Donald Trump in Australia, this is Australian news feed, something about police. And there are topics which are very small, very uh, local. For example, something about Australian open and federal, so something, something tennis, uh, something about the war, something about the budget. So, um, the bottom, so the bottom line here is that when your data has tensorial structure, and you can talk about more about why this particular data actually makes sense to be chunked into particular way, in a particular way, and have a sort of structure, then doing the low rank decomposition like that brings better interpretability. This is the mm, one way to do it, but, so this is much better, but this is very slow. We would like to do compression before we even do this low rank fitting. So here, the second type of compression. I was looking for low rank decomposition, but just to find this low rank decomposition was very slow. I would prefer to inside of this procedure to compress my data and learn for this low rank and the smaller data. So then it, here's the different type of compression. How about we just put a sketch on it, so using the terminology from the first talk. So how, how about we just compress it in some oblivious way without looking for these particular good components and search for the true components on the compressed data. And this is the type of compression we will be interested in here. So it can be used inside of this procedure, it can be used in different procedures, but this is a type of compression which doesn't try to find exact components of certain stru tensorial structure, but rather does something more oblivious, makes our data smaller so that we can work on them, in particular solve these hard optimization problems on the smaller data, okay? Um, again, this is like special research coming on here, how to do this recovery better, how to actually ensure that you find sparse and localized topics, there are things going on. But our goal for this talk will be how to do this on the compressed data. So we don't want to search for the um, particular components, but we want to do something oblivious. So what sort of compression is it? It goes down to um, Johnson and Strauss lemma and other things similar to that. Saying in general, just the following, if you have points in high dimensional space, you could find 
a function, linear function that goes the space of the dimension logarithmic and number of points and knowing nothing about the first space so that the distances are epsilon preserved. This is a very powerful lemma. Okay? So what does it say that we can, so it doesn't, maybe capital N is a billion, right? Uh, small m is logarithmic of number of points. We can make, we can do a linear map so that the pair with distances, we take a distance axis difference between two points will be similar. So what actually makes this um, lemma powerful is that it's generic. That it's not just exist linear function, it's that many linear functions would work here. If I take, for example, a random Gaussian map properly normalized, it will work here. Okay? There's a, a big class of maps I can apply just to my data. I, what, the, what it does, it goes from billion dimensions to like dimension m, which only depends on the number of points, and my distances are preserved. So if I have a question like clustering, like finding distances, I can go down the dimension and solve my problem in here, in the problem. This is very powerful. So people do investigate classes of matrices that satisfy this property. Uh, the thing here is just a, a way to say it. So the matrix is satisfy this property if for any, for the worst case of the set, it preserves distances. The, as I said, um, IED Gaussian matrix would work here, but what else do we want? So yeah, so this is the procedure. We have these distance differences and we just do a linear map. We could have this big random matrix here. We might not want to do that because we actually apply it and the next question is what would be the good matrices to apply? So it's actually tough. People don't have, a, like, deterministic constructions are tough. And in general, you, it's good to have something random, but also this matrix is big. And there is a line of work saying which matrices um, can be applied quickly. So for example, there are Fourier-based matrices which can be applied quickly to the vectors that can be multiplied faster. You could try to sparsify. The more structure, basically the more structure you impose here, you threaten the property that you preserve distance as well. Gaussian matrix, in a sense, is, works very nicely. It preserves distances very well, but it scrambles everything, and also it is dense and big to store. So for uh, our applications, we were, con we were considering a specific uh, structure of this matrix, which makes it memory efficient, and see if it works well for compression of this sort. And then the second question could be to recover, to go back from the purple space to the green space, okay? Um, in particular, uh, if you think about our data being a tensor, we are really not in this situation yet, right? What is this green points? If our green points were tensors, then this capital N was secretly N to the D number of dimension times number of the modes. You can always convert your tensor into a big vector and try to do that. You could do this, first you lose the structure. Maybe here the structure is not that big of a deal if you're interested in distances. However, this dimension N is very huge. So in particular, it's inherited in the matrix G, right? So you might have like done, get rid of the, this dimension N and just work in this space, but even the tool that you use to compress is a big tool. You would like to first have it to apply it faster and not even store it. And one way to um, define this tool when you have this Xi secretly a tensor is to have G correspond, uh, consist of this kind of smaller components which are applied mode-wise, as mode-wise product, or as a um, contraction with the matrix, between tensor and the matrix. You could still think about it in this way. If you implicitly vectorize this tensor, what it will give you is that this matrix G is a chronicle product of A1, A2, A3, slash AD. So it actually means that your matrix G is a chronicle product of matrices. You shouldn't pay too much attention to the second stage. After you do compression once, you could vectorize and do the second stage. But what you, the goal, you don't want to take the big tensor, vectorize it, and hit it with an ID matrix. It would be too big to store. It would be too heavy, too expensive. Okay? Um, here you re review what these mode-wise products are. So I think that maybe for this audience it's all super clear. This is just the definition of how we do this multiplication right here. Um, and then, but then the CP representation, by the way, is this outer product. The key question is, okay, so what sort of mathematical statement we want to get from it, right? So around 2020, there was like a line of works, including ours right here, 
talking about Johnson Linear Strauss properties of the maps of this structure, structure right here, right? So whether those properties would be good compressors, those matrices would be good compressors if we can construct them from smaller matrices, maybe Gaussians, okay? Maybe just generic uh, with Johnson and Strauss property. So we were doing it from slightly different perspectives. So for example, like these papers were considering more specific matrices inside, uh, inside A1, A2, A3. We considered more generic, there are different sorts of guarantees. But so the, what unites them is that we want to compress the data and work in a compressed space. Why we might want to do that? One of the examples is actually leading back to the first slide when you want to do low CP rank fitting, you might work on the compressed space and find coefficients for this approximation for low CP rank. So this first slide, disregarding non-negativity, it was a real application for why, why we were doing this. But there are other examples, for example, normal kernel approximation and the things which are not quite done yet is this if you have non-negative fitting, it's harder actually. But yeah, so you, if you have even a matrix, you compress from two sides, and then this is, this is something in progress. So I have a couple of slides about explaining better how to do it for the fitting problem. Let me think. Maybe I don't stop for too long here. Um, but maybe, yeah, so okay, so this is one. Okay, five minutes on that. If you have a tensor Y, and we want to approximate it as this low CP rank tensor, this is the form. We have outer product of D vectors, and we have sum over that. So we, have, we want to fit some particular rank R. We might not know it, but we fit a particular rank R. So we want to find the XIs and the alpha I to minimize the difference, and typically it is just pointwise norm. So how it's done, one of the popular alg algorithms, alternating least squares, you fix, we initialize them at random, we fix all modes but one, and we learn it. By just arithmetically writing, it ends up being doing the following. You just need to fit the coefficients for a given uh, basis. So you can see it has one mode less, it's because I rewrote the coefficients. So d minus one things here are those that are fixed in a particular step. To fix no particular step, we need to find coefficients. With the uh, recomputing it, we'll be finding us the best x uh, j prime for a particular stage. Okay? And then we do it alternatingly. So then the type of result which is needed for this particular application would be almost Johnson and Strauss result. But so written in the following way, we have a fixed low rank basis, and we want to compress it obliviously and search for the coefficients there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Can, Good. can I ask what the word oblivious means? Oblivious means, uh, so it means that uh, compression may just say Gaussian, or maybe a chronicle product of Gaussians. It means that it's not learned from data. Okay? So it means that I do something like that, and those matrices, they're not learned from particular structure of X. They would be worst case for X's in my set. So all of these examples are oblivious. If I take IED Gaussian, it will be oblivious. If I take sparse Gaussian, it's oblivious. It's not learned for a particular set. So the distribution doesn't depend on the data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are interested in oblivious maps that are structured because they will be memory efficient, but they're still not learned from a particular tensor. Um, yeah. I, I just want to make sure I understand. So you have some D weight tensor, and the way you're going to compress it is by sort of taking a random map on each of your D vector spaces and, and projecting them to smaller vector spaces? Is that? I think we can say that. I think we can say this. Okay. So, so um, yeah, I think, so yes, I think it is true. If you just have a generic tensor, it is exactly that. You can think about this map as the following. You fix one direction, right? And for every fiber, we compress that fiber by matrix. But I think it is exactly contraction. Like, yeah. where you have, and you have contractions on every side. I think we really, really can do it this way. And this is Although, random enough. And this is the matrix, right? This is the matrix, this is the matrix. But the point is the dimension from here goes from N to K. I don't know if people write it this way. From N to K, from N to K. Here, the tensor becomes smaller. And, and the point is that the Johnson-Linden-Strauss principle will still hold in. 
this kind of s sufficiently random projection. Yes, so true. And the, but the main point is how small k could be, right? If my, yeah, so for small enough k. So it's always, this property is for particular k, so k can be done small enough, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is the point. We will see, so just advertising, we will see that for this sort of structure, Johnson and Schaus property will hold enough. If I want to do recovery, I need some property which is stronger than JL, similar to it, and that won't hold just in this, and I need to relax the structure then. That is 2.2 minute summary of the talk. <laughs> uh, these slides are actually just an explanation. Um, yeah, so okay, so their explanation of a particular application when we use this to later learn low rank this CP decomposition from the compressed data. One thing which I want to show here is that the tensor which I compress in this particular application is not an arbitrary n by n by n tensor, but it's actually low rank tensor itself because of the application. It's almost true, it's like low rank there is, there is a caveat, but it's almost just a low rank tensor. So we are also compressing a particular type of tensors. So this also can, can be used for this particular application. Uh, it, this problem can be viewed as an instance of just Johnson Linden Strauss problem when the finite set of tensors for interest are basis, basis tensors for the space. But that's. So, so yeah. for you, low rank means what with respect to the other dimensions? Just for me, Low rank means that I can represent, that it's exact, can be represented as R factors here. Right, and, and I'm asking, mm -hmm. how does that number R compare to D and your local right. dimensions? I see, so um, I think for me, so D for me is small. But I don't, I don't, okay, so D for me can be arbitrary, but then the estimates that you typically get, I don't try trace dependence on D that carefully. It easily can be exponential, so for good applications for me would be then D is not, not large. Okay. But I really then care about the dependence on R and dependence on epsilon. Yeah, but the so, local, mm -hmm. the, my question is, how does R compare to the dimensions of the individual vector spaces that that. Oh, and a dimension of individual space. R should be much, R is small compared to dimension of the tensor. Is this uh, what you mean? Not, not of the total space, of the local dimensions. What are local dimensions? So what are local dimensions? So if that's so an n by n by n yeah. cube, your total space has dimension n cube. cube. And R is much smaller. n is the, what I would call the local dimension. I see, yeah, so, well, I don't think, okay, so I think that my argument will apply Regardless, but the interesting case when R is smaller. R is smaller than N. I, uh, That's my question. I don't think it matters. I think it will apply in both cases. I, will, I would check, but I think it doesn't have this strong requirement. I don't think it has a strong requirement. It can be can be bigger to hold. I don't. Um, let me think. I think. No, I don't think it's it's required a year, so it can be bigger. Think they, yeah, so, so okay, so I have, it, I, have it written here. I have it written here. So R doesn't have to be smaller than N. So R is less than N to the D. Yeah, order. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, I don't have hard restrictions on R somewhere here. In my mind, R is something, I'm interested in low run cases, but I see what see a question, and in principle, I don't have strong Except requirements. Except for that one, you want R less than N to the three halves. Huh? Sorry? You want R less than N to the three halves when Three halves? Three. Where? That's your hypothesis. D over two, what is three halves? Two R squared, forget about the two, that's insignificant. I, R less than. D to be three. Hmm? You want D to be three? How do you get three halves? Yeah, take, take D equal to three, <laughs> and then, then we have halves. R if less I take than D, if we take halves. yes, yes. Yeah. D over two, yeah, three halves if D is three, I agree. Yeah. I'm just trying to get what range of R <laughs> your theorem is applying, because that's fairly large. Yes, yes, so I don't think we are very restrictive in R here, yes. Yes. So what we will care about, we'll care about the dimensions with respect to R. This is known for, well, basically for the matrix case, we expect, this is what we hope for. We hope for the target dimension to be linear in R. So what we hope for, uh, then let me think. Yeah, we can talk more about that, like in this particular case, yes, M is total, yes, here R can, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So, so, mm -hmm. sorry. so what is this eta? Epsilon or eta? Okay. Eta is probability. So this is written in the way, eta is probability you want to pick. Eta will be like 0.9 if you would like, but eta. Oh, I see. You, you want to, eta is your error. Eta is my error, yeah. yeah okay. Error or epsilon? Well, yes, it's the distortion. Eta is a part of a probability model. You're allowed to be wrong when my, you know. What's probability over the randomly chosen contractions? So my, my contractions are random. So whatever I do right here in this particular, so this is the best theorem for this first case. So they are actually structural. This A1, A2, A3 have a particular structure. It's not, it's not just ID Gaussian. I have a counterpart for that for ID Gaussian, so you have worse dimension here for them. Okay? So. I have randomness in how A1, A2, and A3 were created. And this is very standard for the results like that, that these compression matrices have some randomness in them. So then A is the probability of failure. Imagine they were Gaussian. There is a probability that everything just blows up. So that's this probability. Eta is distortion. So A is how I can destroy the geometry. Oh, sorry, yeah, Eps thank you. Epsilon is how I can destroy the geometry. <laughs> um, so, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so, so, what are these maps, L1 and L2? I, I didn't, uh, I didn't yeah. explain. So this, okay, so this is the final theorem. When you want to get to R and epsilon minus two, this is in red because I, there is a reason to, to say this is optimal coming from the matrix case and from the knowledge of Johnson and Strauss. So to get to this optimal dimension, we do the following thing like written on top. The first stage would be to do this mode-wise thing and then vectorize and do the second stage. So L1 is this tensor product of... Uh... L1 is a tensor product between the given tensor X and the A1, A2, A3, A4, AD, where they are, have Fourier randomized in the diagonal. There's a special structure of unitary matrix. They also allow for fast multiply. You could, basically, what the, the counterpart of this result that we have is to take any matrix A1, A2, A3, which satisfies johnson linden strauss property, which is which would be, well, it won't have any distributional assumptions. You, you take your favorite, you plug it in. For example, Gaussian on the right, Fourier on the left, specified Gaussian on the other side. You will have worse guarantees. But you, you can be genetic like that. So this L now is a R-dimensional subspace. Uh, L. L. It's a calligraphic L. Calligraphic. The, first, the first sentence of your theorem. But, uh, right. Um, Hmm, dimensional subspace, do I need it to assume that? So I thought uh, you wanted to do rank R. L, L doesn't, put, uh, oh yeah, for every X and L, yeah. Sorry? I want to do rank R, yeah. I do rank R. R dimensional subspace, yeah, okay, so this is how it, so this is a Johnson and Strauss type thing. So we have this R dimensional subspace, basically we can, it can be applied for anything in the subspace, in particular to R basis vectors. This can, this can be done this way. It's written this way because for CP fitting, but it does precisely that. You have R of them. You, for each of them, you have this, and for linear combinations, by linearity. That's why it's written this way. So this R has nothing to do with rank now, because I thought it was the rank at some point. <laughs> well, it is, this is number of components here. It can be also run. I'm confused. But, then it, it, but now I'm really confused. Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> You, you want to have a low CP rank, right? Is that CP rank R, or is that a different number? Is it a different letter? Yes, it is the same CP rank R for this Z, right? So your space of X's, yeah, your, your, your space L mm -hmm. that um, is, is perturbing your Y is of the dimension equal to the CP rank you're going to do the decomposition into. Okay, yes, yes, yes. So, so it just, okay. I don't so, see okay. why there's a relation between those okay, two. Okay, this, this statement can be viewed as just Johnson and Strauss statement, forgetting about CP rank, forgetting about anything. You take R of them, R will be the number of them, and for all of them you can compress. So then if you want to apply it for CP rank feeding, the place where you apply it is a subspace of dimension R. 
Okay. So you right. can take basis of that subspace and apply to all of them. But you have to know it is in advance. Sorry? You have to know it in advance. You have to know it in advance. You, so you don't have to know it because those maps are oblivious to Z. So that's, the, that's why we want them to be oblivious. So, so to, to compress, we don't need to know the subspace. This is, this is a very important question, actually, because we want these maps to not be learned from particular subspace or particular set. They must work in the worst case. So they are, like say, composed of Gaussians. We don't need to know which subspace we compress for that. That's important. That's because we also have iterative algorithm and we can use them. We can use, generate them over. Um, there is a truth in your, okay, so this is an important point. You don't need to know the subspace to construct the map. That's the difference between low rank approximation. You have an oblivious map, you have a say Gaussian map, you apply it to any subspace, this holds. There is a thing that the probability is per subspace. You need to fix the subspace first, then host with this probability for a given subspace. That is, in this sense, it's not uniform over all R-dimensional subspaces, and this will matter in the, in the next part. This will matter a lot in the next part. Okay. Okay. Um, this is exactly leads me to the Next thing. So we did this data oblivious compression in a sense that we have a random map, maybe it's structured, but it's not learned from a particular data. It's worst case for R points or for R dimensional subspace. It's structured, so it's nice to apply. We don't need to get back there. Yeah, so the point is that we compress and we work in the compressed space, in the purple space. We don't need to get back our original data after compression. But what if we would like to do that? And this is, will be an instance of compressed sensing problem, which, so, which for matrices looks like that. You have a vector, you compress it, you want to get back the vector, okay? So originally it was a for sparse vectors. So you have less measurement, less linear measurements than coordinates in the vector. You observe green stuff, you, you know G, you observe Y, you want to get back your X. You can do it in general, but if the x is sparse, there are methods both optimization and iterative that can get you x back because you know it's sparse. You don't know where sparsity lies, but you know it's sparse. And there are analogs of that to if x is a vectorization of low rank matrix or low rank tensor, and that's what we want, okay? So this is different because it's not just we want to compress. So G is again oblivious, G is maybe Gaussian, or we will want to structure there but it's not learned from X, right? So X can be arbitrary. And now we want to get X back. If we want to get X back, the guarantees that we need, that they need to be uniform over all sparse or all low rank tensors. And that's what makes the difference in what we want mathematically from here. I put the algorithm here just for, for comparison. I think I don't want to stop in it. Um, so I want to, to want to show the property, mathematical properties that we need for iterative algorithms to hold. And this property is called restricted isometry property. So it does the following. It needs the geometry preservation for all sparse vectors with some probability. And if you want to have a takeout from this lecture, this is the takeout for to do this, we need it uniformly over all sparse vectors. So there is a difference between taking even the worst case subspace, but a fixed, fixed set to have something with high probability. Or saying that with high probability for any possible low rank thing, it will work. And this is stronger and we need this for recovery. So it's harder to recover than just to compress. And this is what we need. Um, I don't know, please feel free, free to interrupt me. I, but this is like well, important. Here, here going back and forth between sparseness and low rankness and it's oh, really okay. confusing. So low rankness is sparsity in an arbitrary basis. And for me, it is really similar sort of property. However, yeah, so I- well, Sparseness is basis dependent, low rankness is not. Yeah, you don't know where sparsity is. You don't know where, where it is sparse. I understand that the low rankness is more generic, but it's also sparsity in a known basis. Here it's sparsity in a known support. We don't know support. There we don't know basis. So it's- sort of the same property. You don't know where your vector will be sparse. 
So these methods, they come from sparse recovery or sparse compression. That's why I have sparse here, but the same things will do work for low rankness here. So, okay, so how does this property generally prove? This property generally proved, actually it's tightly connected with the property before. So the property before, Johnson Linus Strauss was saying the following, you have a finite fixed set for which you have this, this, this property, right? And now we have all as sparse vectors, which is an, all, all low rank matrices, which is an infinite space. It's not finite, we should discretize it. So the very, very rough idea how this restricted symmetry property holds, that we prove the Johnson Linus Strauss property for the set and union bound, so, and discretize the set and show that we can apply it from discrete set of points to any low rank thing. So we need, actually need to so know that if we have two points, x and y, and they are very close, this is actually robust, this is a linear thing. So if I have something close, I approximately have it. So I need to uh, find the good discretization of a set of, say, all low rank tensors, matrices, or all sparse vectors. That is what drives it. And then the set of questions, what sort of structure, what sort of structure G should have? Can it be mode-wise, can it be memory efficient? Same questions apply here. But now we need more. We need Johnson Linus Strauss plus concentration, plus discretization of a space. And that is what will be happening. So same thing holds for tensors. We have a vectorization here. We want to, in addition to this Johnson Linus Strauss property, we need to have a good discretization of a space so that we can go from discrete thing to, uh, to uh, infinite thing of all low rank tensors of particular rank. One thing we can notice is that it's all norm dependent, I can normalize, I can assume that my tensors has norm one. I'm rewriting the same things. This is the tensor strict isometry property. When we have a tensor, whatever operator is, we want this, we want preservation for all of them. If we have it, there are theorems saying that we could uh, recover them. Then um, two things I wanted to say here. One thing is that what, this is the explanation why just this scheme for memory efficient measurements won't work for recovery. Uh, the observation you can have here is the following. If you have a tensor, which is actually very simple, it's just have a one and zero fiber and everything else is zero. If you want to compress it just on one side, just one, like see here nothing happens, but you want to compress it just on one side like that, and hope to recover, know that it will be tough because if I compress it on this part right here, it will be the same as just to say, take one vector and make it a smaller vector, and I hope to get it back. I can't solve the system, it's underdetermined. I can't find it from less measurements, and I don't really have a structure in this one fiber. So it, we can, it can be seen that this pure mode-wise procedure cannot be enough for recovery, so we need some more leverage. So one of the things which we proposed here is to do partial reshaping. So reshaping, I don't know how to draw in this way, but this is when you have a 4G tensor and you create a 2D matrix out of it. And then we can compress in this way. Uh, I think just this for, for this talk, I wanted to, I moved the discussion of the result, the mathematical discussion of the result on top. So I think I can finish on that. I can to discuss more on how this restricted asymmetry property is uh, obtained for, the tens for, ten for tensors, like what we actually need to prove that. So as I mentioned, to get this key property of geometry preservation, which is enough for recovery of um, tensors, we need pointwise concentration equalities uh, plus good discretization. This pointwise concentration equalities, this is Johnson and Strauss. For fixed points, for fixed amount of them, we want to preserve geometry. This is point-wise, and then we need a good discretization. So this boils down to estimating complexity or number of points needed to, for discretization for tensorial subspaces. And I have a slide about that. So how we actually measure the complexity of a tensor subspace, okay? So sometimes it's called entropy, sometimes it's called complexity measure. One of the standard tools to do it is via covering numbers. Covering number is defined for a set and a certain distance. So it can be done for any set and by definition, it is how many points the set can be chosen so that any other point is within distance t to, that, to one of the points. At least t, yeah. At most t. At most t. Well, that's my question. Is at it most at least t. or at most? At most. At most. So close, so you need... All the points to be close together. All the points to be close to one of the selected set. 
You select a set of representatives. You want any other point to be close to one of the representatives. So you have a ball. You choose the points in the ball. So that I take any other, I can find one of the chosen closer than T to my point. Oh, oh I see. You have a continuous space and something then like a net or something subset. Like that. It's a net. It's a, yes. Did I put a net? It's called some kind of T net. And uh, this is an example for a high dimensional sphere. It's a famous example. I think I talked about it to Jim at some point. So the, this is a very beautiful argument. So it's sometimes called on, uh, so it's called volumetric argument. How to estimate that, for example, for a dimensional sphere. And the idea is that the minimal covering is maximal packing. So it's how many balls of this radius actually T over two can be packed inside what? Inside the sphere plus T over two. So we can do it in the following way. This is T over two. So a volume of the ball, which is one plus T over two, is volume of the unit ball times one plus this T over two to the N, because this is a dimension greater or equal than the volume of one of them times quantity. And of course, there is a middle, but this is greater. This is strictly greater. Canceling the volume of the unit ball, no, you don't need to remember it. It's one over T over T. This is T over two, so it's one plus two over T. So it's upper bound by three over t to the n. So that's like a textbook, very cute uh, argument. Point is ex exponential in n, and this is true. And one over t in the distortion, this is also true. This become tricky. So now, now this s would be, for example, low rank tensors. And the question is, what is the best covering for them? And that's, that can be tricky, because you can always embed them into n to the d-dimensional ball, and use this n to the d right here, but this is not true because the subspace of low rank tensors is very tiny inside this ball. Okay. Um, actually, for I usually I think that the thing for CP rank was actually recently done, and I have something about it. But I want to show the complexity. So we have this uh, tensors parameterized this way. Um, we can assume that this they have done one by regularization. But so what would, be, like, what would be classically done based on the previous thing? Let's discretize every R-dimensional subset for a, each of them. Let's discretize every particular basis vector. But this is actually can't work this way. Why cannot it work this way? Well, because they could have angles. In particular, knowing that the norm of the whole tensor is one, it doesn't mean that the norm of the basis vector is one. And you can't actually, you can't orthogonalize them. So you cannot make the basis vectors to have norm one. So you cannot apply this thing to the basis vectors. And this is what you know have a small cardinality. So what the, the things which people did before, people assumed additionally that uh, norms of the individual components were bounded by a constant, which implicitly actually the condition on the angles between the basis vectors. Okay? And the, the, the thing which I learned recently, people actually I think did it for CP, and this is so much not my area, but they did it through algebraic varieties and things should be right. They proved the result for this, this is that covering number. This is a set, this is a distortion. You can see this logarithm, so um, should be, yeah, so the logarithm of that is of order n. So it's exponential in n, so it's right dimension in the sense. I'm not, like, I, this is the paper I propose in this area for, so this is what they did for CP rank. I'm not standing behind that. This is not my paper. I think they do something right for CP, but I think it's just a start. It's a very recent paper. So they actually do realize how to compute this um, covering numbers for, um, for like low varieties, and they apply it for a CP rank. Um, and yeah, so one comment is that the general idea, what we do is that once we have this net, I said the following, okay, we have this discretization net, and we have a pointwise estimate. And actually, it's more delicate than that. There are things showing that we actually need these nets for all levels of refinement. We need to integrate over that. It's not enough to say get a distortion and for that to compute the for particular t. It needs to go through integration and through the integral. So it's not so. In other paper, it was actually explained why, it, for example, in tensor world, you cannot get away with the net of the special number of granularity you need to have this decay in S to zero and you need to integrate over that. What we did, we did it like earlier, we did it for um, higher order SVD, so we had orthogonality or approximate orthogonalities for our nets we were actually based off the basis vectors. We had to deal with the angles, we had to work with that, 
and we had to do point-wise concentration, which is uh, more sophisticated than just Johnson and Neutral, so all the pieces are, have some stuff in them, but um, for a variety of the compression maps, you can do that, and this is a takeaway from the compression, from the recovery part. I feel like, how much time do you have? Five minutes? Yeah, you? Okay, yeah, this is good, okay. So let's, this is a takeaway from this restricted symmetry property recovery part. So we propose to do maps like that. We can't do maps just like that. We need to do partial reshaping there. So actually, this is the lie. To apply that, you would need at least 4D tensor and need to reshape it to the matrix. Um, and I think, so this doesn't affect the CP rank or HOSVD rank. This statement that you do need to reshape if you want that, it's true for CP rank and for high order SVD rank. So, um, however, even with this reshaping, you can do very significant memory reduction because your individual matrices are much smaller and you have compatible time and compatible uh, performance and it's even better. And the compression matrices are data oblivious, generic and flexible. So we have theoretical guarantee. So the one like last part of that is that this reshaping is necessary was really bothersome for me. It's really bothersome for me because if you have a 3D tensor, which is the, the example like Jim proposed, you have D plus three, you can't do that. So what you can do, you can reshape it to a vector and heat it with IID matrix. This was known before, and this is not memory efficient. And then the part, that, so recovery doesn't have to go through this restricted isometry property and go through iterative methods. There are at least two approaches for recovery. This one is, uni so okay, I'm going back to the matrix case. Is there, um, what if they don't have, re the maps don't have reasonable restricted isometry property? There are iterative methods and there are also direct methods, which won't be uniform for all low rank matrices, but they can go through uh, linear algebra, through randomized linear algebra, basically. Yeah. And such methods can be also applied for tensors. This is done for matrices. This won't be uniform in terms of that you set a probability and then for any tensor, so you set a probability, you sample uh, your measurement scheme. And for that measurement matrix, if it is from the good case, then for anything, for any low rank thing, it will work. This is not uniform, you're not universal here in this sense. But it does give you a good recovery. And then the question is, what were the measurements? So again, we cannot afford to compress in every dimension. So the takeaway here is that what you could do, you could have a family of measurements so that you don't compress, so this is identity. You don't compress here, but you compress here, and you compress here. But then you can have a family of them. You can compress, like you can have three of them. One, two, three, you can know three. One that leaves out two, one that leaves out one, and one that leaves out three. So you can have a family of those. Each of them does not compress one of the modes. And for that, you can run, you can prove the um, low rank tucker recovery. And the other idea would be to do uh, connective rows, which is the same as to do the following, to, to, do, to go to one right here, to get one measurement. And you have many independent measurements like that. This way you have more independence, so it's less memory efficient, but you have more freedom, more flexibility, so it's easier to work with that. So with this type of uh, maps, the algorithm which should be reminiscent to what we talked about when we talked about randomized range finder, because this is like compressions with randomized matrices, we can get a recovery. And what's point with the point here is that the target dimension now does not depend on n at all. So the target dimensions actually can be smaller than in the uniform case, because this is a direct recovery. Um, that is it as a big, yeah. So then the future directions are the following. There are many open questions. So for direct iterative recovery, so I have a slide which I want to update. So for CP rank guarantees for iterative recovery, this all good, goes to good covering number for CP rank tensors. I think there is this significant step very recent, but if your structure is not necessarily low CP rank tensor, if you have a tensor network there, if you have a tensor ring, there's something else. So these nets, are good discretizations for low rank tensor structures can be a way to show that the sets are not too bad and you can actually obliviously compress and recover from that and can do compress sensing on these uh, simpler objects. Then there are different algorithms for recovery, those that work better than the one which I didn't really talk a lot about. And then 
In the neg going back to the negativity, once you compress, there are other downstream tasks you can do. You can compress and do CP feeding, but there are many, many things you might ask, especially when you want to do data science on that, what can you do in compressed domain? And then to be connected to what geometry properties you want to be preserved while you compress. Sometimes you want this restricted isometry property. Sometimes you want Johnson in the shells, but depending on the task, you might want to have different sort of properties preserved in the compression, right? So some, some compressions might want to preserve non-negativity, for example. This takes restrictions in which maps can be applied. You, we didn't try to make our maps non-negative here. What if we want to make our maps non-negative so that the compressed object is non-negative too? This all poses the questions about there would be task dependent on. Yeah, thank you.